Hi everyone, a very good morning and good evening uh, from Toronto and a warm welcome to all of us who are joining us for the fourth and final session of our four part webinar series on road safety in transit oriented developments or DODs. This webinar is part of the ongoing work on integration of road safety considerations in transit oriented development projects for the World Bank <clears throat> that has been prepared with funding from UK aid through Global Road Safety Facility or GRSF. Some house rules before we begin. Uh, this is a webinar, so all the participants are automatically muted. You may type in your questions and any concerns that you may have in the Q&A box, and we will try our best to address that. For our presenters, I would request you all to be on mute when you're not presenting. And lastly, while some of us may have our cameras on, we understand if you don't want to turn on your video. I would now invite Felipe Targa, who is a senior urban transport specialist at the World Bank and who is also chairing this session. Thank you very much. And let me extend a welcome to this um, uh, session and introduce you um, a wonderful set of uh, speakers uh, that we're gonna uh, have today. And uh, let me apologize uh, in advance if I mispronounce your first and last name. So I'll do my best. But we will start with uh, Prenda Mehta. Uh, she's a lead urban development specialist at WRI India. She works in um, TOD projects, land value capture, safe access to mass transit, and different uh, other uh, policy and capacity building on TOD. We will continue with um, Abhishek Behera. Uh, he's an urban planning consultant at WRI India as well. Uh, we will continue with uh, Bike Back Kosh. Uh, he has been an associate of WRI India as well since the last four years. His work is primarily on conceptualizing, you know, road safety projects, especially those related to vision zero and uh, child road safety. And we will um, conclude this uh, first um, part of the webinar uh, with our speakers with uh, uh, Saurab Jain uh, is a consultant at WRI India as well, involved in urban design and road safety projects. So without further ado, um, over um, to you, Premna. Thank you, Abhishek and Philippe, for facilitating this conversation. Hello and welcome to all of you who are joining us today. In our previous sessions, we had discussed about five-step TOD framework with details on first three stages of the framework. This is within the fifth stages of this framework, that is finance and implement respectively. The finance stage focuses on dynamics of real estate financing, infrastructure investments, and role of private developers in TOD. It provides an overview of financing tools that can be used by city to achieve the TOD planning policies projects and initiatives as identified. Implementation stage ties the diverse interventions needed to make TOD happen from prioritizing projects, capacity building and monitoring. It provides an overview of the tasks and subtasks required to implement TOD plans, including the institutional framework and supportive public policies. Please note that under each of these stages, we will be discussing points that are relevant to road safety only. So far, it is established that road safety has always been a derivative to TOD projects, and this approach is not different when it comes to finance. This section tends to explore how some of the available mechanisms can contribute to road safety in TOD projects. TOD projects are generally associated with complex site acquisitions and land assemblage processes, as well as high capital investments towards generous public infrastructure. From a public sector perspective, these high investments costs require innovation in combining diverse financing tools with strategic private sector partnerships to include market-driven revenue generating components. These financial in instruments need supporting policies at national levels. Implementing these policies at local level requires a detailed structuring of project implementation parameters with strategic funding mechanisms and ability to raise capital and allocate revenues. When it comes to road safety, development incentives and financial tools offers ways to ensure road safety as well as help achieve other goals of TOD projects. Let's discuss how each of these can contribute to achieve road safety. 
Since TOD is deviation from traditional single use development models, incentives can of, often, u, often used to attract developers and investors in developing the TOD areas. Development incentives covers various in, incentives that the TOD implementing agency can offer to private developers in the TOD areas to ensure development happens in line with TOD strategy. We recommend using such incentives to aid in provision of safe and accessible walking and non-motorized transport infrastructure within the TOD areas. There are three types of development incentives that facilitates road safety interventions, namely uh, zoning incentives, parking incentives, and financial incentives. It is imperative to note that under each one of the stated incentive types, I'm discussing only the ones that are relevant to road safety. Zoning incentives for achieving road safety can be given in the following ways. Firstly, through property easement that help in incentivizing private developers of large uh, plots uh, to grant easement access to pedestrians and non-motorized transport users through their properties. Secondly, through amalgamation of setbacks, incentivize developers of adjacent parcels for amalgamating adjoining setbacks between buildings to create new right of ways restricted for pedestrian and empty movements. Thirdly, subdivision of large parcels calls for incentivizing subdivisions of parcels with public right of ways created in between. And lastly, establishing direct links to stations, incentivize direct linking properties to the transit station using partnership models between city and developers through a combination of ad grade and grade separated networks like skywalks and subways. The next type of development incentive is parking incentive that revolves around modifying parking requirements by parking reduction so that reclaimed land parcel can be allocated for NMT infrastructure and establishing parking maximums so that the limited land area is devoted to parking capacity and adequate space can be allotted to NMT infrastructure. Besides, it encourages the users to use public transport to access the facility. The other way to ensure road safety is to establish parking access restriction for minimizing disruption in pedestrian movement. The last in the list of development incentives is financial incentives that could be extended to stakeholders who invest in infrastructure and streetscape that are critical for creating pedestrian friendly and private investment friendly environments. Developers may be given incentives to adopt sidewalks adjacent to their property and ensure that it is well maintained and cleaned as per city guidelines and policies. Globally, in many cities, sidewalks maintenance and upkeep is responsibility of residents or business owners. With this, we move towards some of the finance tools that contribute to road safety specific interventions. Direct fees through tools like congestion, pricing and parking fees. Application of such tools in TOD areas and discourage the user to use private modes for travel and indirectly help in achieving safer streets. Special funds such as urban transport funds can be created at state and city level for funding urban transport related activities that include projects related to NMT and safe access to public transit. Discretionary transportation improvement grants are usually available with national level governments for investing in specific projects at city or state levels. The implementing agency for TOD projects may apply for these funds to carry out on-ground implementation that will ascertain road safety in TOD projects. The next are road safety funds. These are usually set up by state or national governments for undertaking road safety related activities that include road safety studies and research, road crash data analysis, road safety awareness programs, identification of accident prone areas, and corrective measures, training programs, and trauma care. The source of uh, these funds is from the revenue collected through traffic fines, parking, taxes, fuel tax, insurance, congestion, pricing, vehicle registration, etc., along with contributions from state and federal governments. The last in the list is philanthropic uh, or corporate social responsibilities, CSR fund. These are, there are various global philanthropies and national organizations that fund projects in lower middle income countries or selected sector respectively to reduce the number of um, fatalities from road ac accidents. 
Such funds can be sourced by city authorities to further the agenda of road safety within TOD areas. With this, I will pause and request my colleague Webhav to discuss a case of Haryana Vision Zero in India that, that highlights the collaborative efforts of public and private sector by utilizing CSR funding. Before he begins, it is important to note that the said case study is not specific to TOD, but has immense relevance for TOD projects considering the road safety perspective. Over to you, Webhav. Uh, thank you, Prerna. Uh, and I hope my screen is visible and I'm audible. Yes, you are. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Webhav, as... Webhav, we are seeing your... Uh notes oh sorry a presenter's view yeah is this all right yes all right uh, so as uh, prerna mentioned this is a very road safety oriented uh, case study but the mod model adopted is very much replicable in tod or any other projects as well so over the course of this webinar series i'm sure you must have uh, heard a lot about why we need Vision Zero, why we need to focus on road safety. I'll start directly with why Vision Zero in India, how it started and how Haryana Vision Zero came into being. So in 2015, when uh, India signed the Brasilia Declaration, uh, WRI India started the India Vision Zero campaign as an umbrella initiative under which uh, different states could uh, come together and start their own contextualized, localized state vision zero programs. And in 2017, Haryana became the first uh, Indian state to adopt the vision zero approach to road safety. And the success, success of the program has been such that it continues to influence neighboring states to uh, start the vision zero project. So, as the, uh, as the traffic fatalities in the country led to the signing of Brazilian declaration, similar trends in Haryana uh, led to the state government initiating the Vision Zero program. And by the time we started the project in 2017, the number of fatalities in Haryana had already crossed 2000, uh, the 5000 mark. So, the Haryana Vision Zero program is a joint initiative of uh, the, the government of Haryana acting through its transport department, WRI India and NASCOM Foundation. So in its first year, uh, the project was started in 10 districts. So Haryana is basically uh, the, uh, divided into 22 districts and uh, we started this project in 10 districts as a pilot. And by the end of the first year and looking at the, the on ground change that we were able to make, the state government decided that we extend this program to all the 22 districts of the state. But before I get into the Haryana Vision Zero model, it is important to understand how traditionally road safety initiatives have been approached, how they have been funded and how they have been conceptualized. So road safety is a subject under the state list as per the uh, constitution of India, there are three lists. So road safety comes under the state list. That means that the states have the authority to formulate strategies, policies that they think will be best for their state. So India observed its 31st road safety week in January 2020 and the focus of all these uh, road safety initiatives over the last 30 years had been around improving driver behavior, uh, educating children and uh, awareness raising. The impact of this 30 years of investment was not what we may have desired 30 years ago. So from 36,000 fatalities, we have now come to 150,000 fatalities. Simil so, so this was how uh, the government was uh, approaching road safety. Similarly, we have private funders also, uh, as Prerna mentioned, we have the corporate social responsibility, the CSR funds, 
so the indian legislation mandates that large corporations large businesses uh, contribute about 2% of their profits on socially relevant projects so these uh, initiatives road safety initiatives come under their uh, csr funds csr initiatives but they have been small scale stand alone interventions which again focus a lot on education and awareness quite a few have been around vehicle safety drunken driving seat belt use and so on but last 30 years of uh, road safety initiatives basically uh, what has happened is that uh, there 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 are resources there is a willingness to invest but the investment has not been effectively utilized in a comprehensive manner so we are focusing only perhaps on one e there are four to five six e's of road safety we are focusing only on one e of uh, road safety what the need is that we we conceptualize a program that looks at road safety in a comprehensive manner and we are able to create a financial model that uh, that invests in such a model and that is where i think the haryana vision zero model was able to innovate a, a different type of a public private partnership so as i mentioned uh, hvz is a joint initiative of uh, Uh, transport department wri india and uh, ragri foundation uh, the, the transport department being the implementation partner so it is responsible for uh, construction of roads uh, enforcement policy doing awareness campaigns and so on and so forth wri india is the knowledge partner responsible for the training and capacity building of the technical team uh guiding the team on data collection analysis research and technical review of the solutions that the hvz team proposes to the government and rahagiri foundation is the operations partner responsible for the running of the program so basically hiring the skilled experts who actually go on ground and do all the road safety work do the data collection uh analyze all police incident reports investigate crashes do road auditing and uh develop solutions for uh, how we can you know improve the road safety in the state so of the total now the total contribution that these partners uh give to the uh, to the program uh comes to around 15 million dollars about 110 crores in indian rupees that is about 15 million us dollars 95% of which comes from the government uh from the transport department and this fund basically is uh is used for uh construction of these uh, the, of the proposals that are submitted doing awareness campaigns doing tactical urbanism events uh and also to a large extent providing accommodation and office space to the uh, hvz experts the last 5% is where the uh, the ngo partners are contributing but that 5% is really the backbone of the entire project because without this 5% all resources contributed by the government this 95% again gets redirected from a project that comprehensively focuses on uh, on ground changes to the disjointed stand alone road safety initiative that had been in the norm uh, before hvz came so uh, transport department as a government entity is has access to the usual sources of government funds like taxes uh, funds from the national government and uh, uh, loans and grants from inter intergovernmental organizations but wri india and ragri foundation as ngos are entirely dependent on programmatic grants uh, donations and csr funds of private sector companies so uh, 
of the resources that are required by the ngo partners these resources this 5% basically is uh, required for hiring the technical experts doing their te training uh, uh, all the uh, research that goes into uh, solution development and everything that covers the uh, 5% that is required for running this uh, this program so while we have a certain requirement the monetary support that is provided by our donors the csr partners is is not equivalent to how much is required so the gap is basically fulfilled by in kind support from these donors and this is just a, a distribution of how uh, the two of our biggest partners uh, one is honda two wheelers motors india uh, which is one of the largest two wheelers manufacturers in india and nagaro that's a software uh, technology company uh, that this is the contributions that they have put in the haryana vision zero program over the last 3 years so this uh, model that we have adopted in haryana vision zero is innovative in the sense that it encourages effective utilization of financial resources so uh, instead of just focusing on how to fund projects it is also looking at what to fund so the projects need to be a comprehensive impactful measurable and uh, a sustainable uh, project then it is encouraging uh, it's innovating a ppp model that is uh you know uh, which encourages the private sector to take up invest in this program because they are able to show it as a as a csr initiative and lastly and most importantly is the uh, the autonomy that this financial model provides to, to the program because uh, without this autonomy we would have got entangled in the red tape that is there in the in the government and because we are not getting into all this we are able to execute a lot of things very quickly we are able to hire experts sooner we are able to uh, submit our proposal sooner and they are uh, they are getting executed sooner had this been an entirely government run government led initiative uh, the possibility of doing all this good work in uh, in a short period of time would have been uh, difficult and before i end uh, there is uh, there is a need to talk about what happens in case this csr fund stops so there may be changes to the uh, company's priorities uh, there could things like covid 19 it, it was a very unprecedented situation but what it meant for social initiatives was, was that a lot of funding that was coming into say education health road safety got redirected into fighting the covid 19 pandemic or any other reason for any other reason if the if this funding stops what is what is the solution what is our contingency and the solution is institutionalizing our projects so in case of road safety uh, the supreme court of india has a committee on road safety that mandates a creation of road safety fund now as i mentioned road safety is a state subject so every state uh, formulates its own strategies its own rules so haryana uh, in, uh, uh, notified its road safety rules in 2018 there are about 50 20 uh, points that are mentioned in the road safety rules that talk about how these road safety funds can be utilized uh, one of them and the first one of them is that this amount can be used for implementing schemes projects and awareness programs pertaining to road safety and related activities so so the idea is basically i mean trying to correlate to tod projects the idea is to find legislation, government schemes, or funds that allow institutionalization of our projects. With that, I would like to uh, stop and over to you, uh, Abhishek. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Prerna and Vaibhav. So, in this workshop series, we've looked at the preceding four stages in the TOD framework, which are assess, enable, planning and design, and finance. The final stage is on implement. It is to tie together the different outcomes and interventions needed to make TOD happen. In this stage, in order to ensure road safety, it is pertinent to overcome the various barriers identified in the earlier stages, including regulatory and institutional gaps, data availability, financial resources and opportunities, monitoring, and lastly, indicators for success. The implement stage has three components that typically do not follow a linear process, but instead are an iterative process with continuous feedback loops. The capacity building is the process through which individuals and organizations strengthen and maintain their capability to set and achieve their development objectives. Phasing allows for development to be scheduled based on multiple factors, such as availability of resources and time, priority to the city, and possible risks. And this helps to test these strategies and estimate the outcomes for any kind of future scaling up and also ensures and enhances public buy-in for the project. And lastly, the process of monitoring and evaluation <coughs> allows an agency to learn and understand from the impacts of, of the strategies. Key performance indicators or KPIs provide a way for cities to measure the performance of their TOD initiatives against larger global standards and outcomes. Through the previous stages of TOD framework, certain gaps get highlighted, which need to be addressed to ensure a smooth implementation. Some of these gaps are inst institutional gaps. Is there a right mix of departments and agencies involved that understand the demand and the requirements of high density areas? Are they able to contribute towards a TOD initiative? Like any large scale planning project, it is required for agencies and stakeholders to be involved from the start. A TOD project involves densification around a transit node and agencies and departments dealing with real estate, housing, public works, parks and recreation, sanitation, etc., may play minor and indirect, yet a very significant role to ensure road safety within a TOD area. Onboarding of some agencies such as traffic operations, police, etc., can help in streamlining of data collection, identification of critical areas, analysis, and developing possible solution. Inclusion of representatives of the private sector and civil society as part of the project team is ideal. Next, we have the regulatory gaps. As we learned in the enable stage, implementation of TOD requires a supporting and enabling environment for implementation. One needs to ensure if these existing TOD policies look into road safety concerns and make an effort for addressing the same. A larger vision for road safety at state or federal levels can help in paving ways for road safety in TOD as well. They can get tied in with the TOD policy to ensure road safety standards for all road users are maintained. As Prerna discussed earlier, zoning regulations may be drafted within the TOD policies and guidelines to address the needs of vulnerable users through proactive incentives and tax cuts. This leads us to understanding any financial gaps that might be present within the implementing agency. Any sort of implementation requires funds, whether it is building on-ground infrastructure or hiring of technical expertise. This may get addressed through developing municipal budgets where a percentage of tax revenue is earmarked for road safety that can be tapped for TOD projects to carry out safety baseline studies, data collection, and implementation of safe system infrastructure. As we heard from Prerna and Webhav earlier, the implementation agency can also get funding from philanthropic organizations or apply for grants and discretionary fundings from the state and federal governments. Lastly, we have knowledge gaps. It is of utmost importance to have the technical resources who are equipped for the job at hand. That is, they understand the requirements of a TOD development as well as are aware of the road safety needs of road users, especially the vulnerable users. Technical gaps can be enhanced through hiring experts and including consultants with requisite experience. It also includes developing capacity building initiatives, similar to our workshop now, where staff and other stakeholders can be provided with information on best practices for inclusion of road safety in TOD. Such stakeholder engagements, effective public participation, and a participatory design process help in identifying the challenges and opportunity areas 
and allows to prioritize projects, including funding allocation. In the last webinar, we learned about different planning and design measures to <clears throat> ensure road safety. While these strategies may be easy to execute in a greenfield scenario, they need to be carefully and cautiously implemented in a brownfield development. Such capital improvement projects are very expensive and it must be understood that they may not work, they may work in a particular scenario, but may not necessarily give the same or similar results in another location, even within the same TOD area. Therefore, such safety planning and design measures need to be tested and phased before they can be rolled out to fruition. Design implementation may be carried out through tactical urbanism mechanisms, which include low cost temporary changes that may help in assessing the impact on traffic movement patterns and road safety. Carrying out pilot projects within the TOD and for gathering political and citizen support for implementation of a project. Learning from this step may then be analyzed and modified if needed to execute a more permanent long-term solution. The key performance indicators or KPIs help implementing agencies to measure the overall performance of the TOD strategies. This involves the process of monitoring outputs and evaluating outcomes to learn and understand the changes due to the execution of these specific strategies. Specific Outputs of a strategy, such as, for example, length of a protected bike lane in the network, need to be identified and measured by the implementing agency and periodically monitored. Project outcomes measure the extent to which a strategy has helped in achieving the larger goal, for example, increasing cycle ridership within the TOD area. These outcomes are evaluated based on the industry standards and benchmarks as set for a geographic context. These results need to be communicated to the decision makers and community members through comparison between a before and after scenario. This would help in determining, uh, help determine any kind of improvements uh, required in the planning process and inform design approach for future projects and assist in advocating for the same to community members, political le leadership and stakeholders. These new changes will then be required to be monitored and evaluated, repeated in a similar cyclic manner to ensure the effectiveness of the strategy, whether the road safety requirements and TOD goals are being prioritized and the impact it is having on the build form and the users. With this, I will now invite my colleague Saurabh Jain to present the case study on tactical urbanism strategies implemented in one of the suburban train station areas in Mumbai, India for improving road safety. Over to you, Saurabh. Uh, thanks, Abhishek. Hello, everyone. Um, moving to our next session, uh, tactical urbanism measures in Mumbai. <clears throat> can you all see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. OK. Um, uh, we will, uh, in this uh, session, we will look at a little background about road safety in Mumbai. What is the planning and implement uh, implementation process for streets followed by the city? And then we will look at tactical urbanism and how uh, we were able to use it as a tool to introduce road safety. And we will see that through an example uh, to a junction case study in Mumbai. If you look at modal share in Mumbai, more than 50% of population consists of pedestrians and cyclists. 25% use local trains for commuting. Whereas over 50% of total fatalities involve pedestrians and cyclists. <clears throat> Mumbai says nearly 500 fatalities every year and more than 30% of these fatalities occur at junctions. Now this is a really high percentage given that they take up only fraction of the total road area. Now, we may do a lot of designing of our streets and junctions, and our designs may look good on paper, but the support to bring this transformation in public projects is challenging. Let's see what is the planning and implementation process for the uh, streets Mumbai as a city follows. Now, these are various departments under Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai, responsible for planning and implementation of streets in the city. Of these, uh, traffic planning and roads department have a larger role. Every year, a comprehensive list of work is prepared. 
This list is prepared with the inputs from one that is traffic and planning department, which is responsible for proposing new roads and road widening for uh, and for hiring the consultant to prepare street sections. Second is your local cooperators or MLAs, which are elected bodies, and if they want to propose any improvement within their constituencies. Then there is ward officers. Mumbai is divided into uh, multiple wards, and each ward has a ward officer who is part of municipal corporation. And local citizens and citizen body approaches them for any improvement. So there are inputs from uh, uh, for the list which comes from them as well. And then there is a comprehensive mobility plan, which is a mobility study which the corporation does every few years to understand mobility related issues. And then these issues are kind of taken up for improvement. Now this list is taken up by roads department, which is uh, responsible for uh, responsible for selection of corridors and junctions, which will be taken up for that particular year. And uh, that depends on multiple factors, whether it's a new road, what's the priority what's the budget required and whether it's under dlp now dlp is a defect liability period which is basically a warranty which a contractor gives for 5 years now within this time one cannot make any changes to the implementation uh, and if you do make changes contractor's liability for maintenance is nullified so basically whatever you are implementing you are stuck with it for at least 5 years and post that you have to wait for it to uh, uh, wait for it to turn to uh, come for improvement now once the final list is created contractors are appointed for construction post which the roads department hands over the streets to the respective ward officers for its maintenance now if we go by this process it may take years to bring in change and it's uh, this process is extremely time consuming expensive and needs convincing at multiple levels but our cities are constantly changing by the time we implement things on ground ground reality has changed from what it was planned for and as rightly said by uh, one of the pioneers of tactical urbanism city can't address its challenges merely through planning for long term but through many small term projects involving smaller tactics making long term possi uh, projects possible we are we constantly need to innovate and hence tactical urbanism uh abhishek has already touched upon what tactical urbanism is so i'm not going to go in depth about it but uh, as i mentioned like it's a short term low cost and uh, scalable in nature which can instigate and facilitate long term change it's an iterative process uh, it allows testing of uh, different concepts before actually making large and permanent investments and most importantly it draws attention to perceived shortcomings and inspire action <clears throat> now uh, uh we'll talk about this through an example uh, in mumbai for which let's have look at some of the uh, intersections in mumbai now these are uh, some of the busy intersections in mumbai and as you can see all of them are extremely chaotic and uh this is hp junction in mumbai and it's barely 500 meters away from the one of the busiest local train station named bandra station in mumbai this is how the junction looked like before it was recently transformed it sees over 5000 vehicles during peak hour and it sees equal number of pedestrians too and it has like extremely large area and let's see how this junction performs these pedestrians are on their way to bandra station for which they have to cross the road you will see that they are waiting on the road itself because there is no other space for them to wait traffic island is completely built and inaccessible once the signal stops pedestrian cross and wait at the next safe space that is next to the median now even as they are waiting there more pedestrians come and join them and there are few near misses between people and the roads uh, people on the road and the cars passing now these are uh, some of the other issues at the junction which is large intersection area undefined and worn out pedestrian crossings <clears throat> pedestrian crossings leading to dead ends lack of pedestrian refuge areas improper placement of the median 
and it increases the uh, area of intersection unnecessarily. I will not go much in detail about the design, but we'll quickly run through the pointers. The proposed design looked at uh, extending medians and creating pedestrian refuge areas, reclaiming space from the residual areas at intersection to create refuge islands, reclaiming unnecessary slip lanes to create public space and pedestrian refuge. Now, this is a major pedestrian route uh, uh, for people who are coming from the station and going to the station, and it required a larger holding space. And overall, collecting the lane alignment and street geometry and compacting the design uh, intersection area. Uh, by this design, we reduce the size of the junction by almost one third of its total area. Now, taking so much space from the junction was not going to be easy. It was going to require a lot of convincing. Now, we had the design worked out on paper, but now what? So then we started engaging with city authorities and different stakeholders. As I mentioned earlier, tactical urbanism is a short-term and low-cost uh, method of bringing change. We were somehow able to convince them for a trial. And one fine night with just 100 barricades, paint, and proposed design drawings, we were able to transform this massive junction from this to this, which had uh, proper medians, proper uh, corrected geometry, compacted intersection area, space for pedestrians, uh, refuge for pedestrians to uh, wait for their uh, turn to cross, walkable sidewalks, and it was designed for all age groups. And uh, <clears throat> kids on cycle in Mumbai is a rare sight. And that's why like this is one of my favorite image from the project. The trial went on for 45 days. During the trial, we constantly, uh, we were constantly evaluating the junction to evaluate the impact of the trial before and after comparisons were made. All the movements were critically observed. And we also did video conflict analysis uh, during and before the trial, uh, about which Benoit had explained in detail in his presentation during uh, session two of this workshop series. And we observed that high risk conflicts per hour dropped by almost 70%. Now, after measuring and data collection during the trial, we went back to our working board, made required changes to improvise the design and tested those changes while the trial was still on. Now, uh, as Webhav also uh, mentioned in his presentation, like when we talk about road safety in general over here, it's limited to uh, wearing helmets or uh, put your seatbelt or uh, street users to follow uh, uh, discipline on the street. But what this trial did was highlighted physical infrastructural deficiencies, which is rarely talked about. And that's what inspired change. Now, during the trial, we also invited uh, multiple city authorities and other stakeholders to see how the junction was performing during the trial and got them on board for permanent transformation of the junction. And this is how the junction looks like today. I will just quickly run through the process that we went through. So the trial went on for 45 days. During the trial, we measured before and after scenarios. We collected data to support the design. We re uh, revised the design as per the learning from the trial. We got city authorities on board for implementation. And during construction, we also did capacity building workshops for engineers and contractors who were actually working on ground. And the long-term change was <clears throat> visible. Now, this trial uh, was conducted in 2017. The success story of it soon gained a lot of traction all over the city, and it encouraged different ward officers, cooperators, and others to bring such transformation within their wards as well. And since then, we have worked on multiple street transformation projects with city authorities and cooperators. Uh, we didn't conduct trial for all the junctions because some of them didn't require trial, but also after a few initial trials of critical junctions, it helped us gain certain trust from the city authorities and other stakeholders, which really helped. So you can real, uh, like you can see the expand of uh, the, the effect of just one trial leading to another and the cover uh, it has uh, reached in diversity. 
Now, these are some of the images of the trials uh, and implementation of designs which we have worked on since the HP Junction trial. Yeah, with this, I will stop and hand over the session back to our chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and let me thank all the speakers for a really good time management. We are uh, just uh, on time. And uh, we will move now to the panel discussion. Uh, let me just use a, a minute to also to congratulate all the consulting work in this really timely and interesting um, update of the what is uh, now uh, one of our premier resources uh, in the bank on our clients for TOD implementation. And this is a, a resource um, toolkit toolbox, you know, developed by or um, a own, you know, there are uh, Olivier, you know, this is a, a resource that we have been using in several cities, you know, regions. We were going to hear, you know, some of the those experiences, you know, using um, this uh, resource um, and implementation of projects. So we will be uh, focusing and I'm going to introduce now our um, group of uh, uh, panel discussions and we will going to be hearing from them on, you know, best practices, uh, barriers or recommendations to overcome uh, those barriers. Uh, this particular last two um, steps of uh, finance and implementation, it has been, you know, or is still, you know, the, um, the, they are the main barriers, you know, for advancing, you know, TOD and TOD with consideration of road safety. So let's start, you know, with, uh, uh, let me introduce all of them first, you know, and then we will we'll probably the flow then will be better. So we will start with Claudia Diaz. She's the head of the road safety office uh, in the Secretary of Mobility of Bogota since uh, 2017. Um, and she was, you know, the, her, her supervision, Bogota adopted vision zero policy in 2017. And um, Claudia, uh, we understand and we have been, you know, working and supporting Bogota and the current administration, this new uh, concept that most beyond, you know, the TOD that, 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 that the city is implementing around the, 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 the Metro line project. But right now, you know, this top priority of the mayor of creating this 15 minute uh, city, you know, the, the, the network of uh, vital neighborhood green districts. Uh, uh, and we understand that, you know, the, a key aspect, you know, of that, um, uh, of that, of that program is relates to the uh, vision zero and road safety uh, strategies. You try, you know, to uh, really do a speed management to, uh, um, to improve the road safety uh, uh, of these areas to make it more liable, safe, and connected. Um, in terms of implementation of the, uh, and reflecting on what we just saw in the presentations and some case studies in India, um, what is the strategy and your strategies ahead of this vision zero policy on this um, new way of, you know, land use planning and uh, a mobility uh, a planning uh, in the city uh, that is being implemented with the current administration. Um, so you will have three minutes. This is going to be an opening question and you will have two more minutes then as a follow-up question. Over to you, Claudia. Thank you, Felipe, and thank you, everyone, and thank you for the presenters. It was such a good presentation and I, I, we have almost, like, as you said, Felipe, like we start implementing Vision Zero in 2017. And part of, like, um, part of like the core of our vision, it's uh, providing safe infrastructure. And as you said, like this comes together with, uh, with a speech management program for us. Like we want to change our streets. We want to make it safer. But at the same time, you know, like we have to have a, a a great marriage between, you know, like safe providing speed limits, safe, safer speed limits, but also providing safer infrastructure. So now what we have, it's uh, an opportunity to change our uh, urban development plan for the city, which is a plan uh, in a, a long-term plan. And what we're doing right now is trying to make all those principles from Vision Zero, from safe infrastructure designs, you know, like 
to make it part of that plan so we can come up with clear like rules in order to provide a safer street. See, we want if we want a city, you know, a, a more for people to walk and bike more and more and more. And if we want a sustainable city, you know, where people use sustainable modes, we have to provide safe conditions and safe infrastructure in order for that to happen. So we cannot, and 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 as we said all the time, we cannot have a, you know, like we, we cannot be promoting cycling if we are not providing like a safe infrastructure. So what we've been working on and we first start uh, some of the examples that we we see we saw in, in Mumbai. We were we, we, for the past years we were working on those kind of urban um, tactic urbanism uh, actions in different parts of the city. So people will start you know like they start to know what it feels like to have a different environment. You know like a safer environment. Sometimes people they just don't don't see, you know, like they deserve a safer street. You know, like it's something like they don't even know what to ask for. Here, like in Bogota, we have some lot of cases where people asking for pedestrian bridge because they don't know they need is a traffic light. So they're just, you know, like asking for what they see, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like they, they, they really just, uh, you know, like they see that we are that the city used to build like pedestrian bridges all the time, so they are that, that's what they are asking for, but they are not really thinking what the, their needs are. So, I'm uh, uh, so from those examples that we see in Mumbai, we're doing the same, and I think that the, the important part is to have the community knowing what this what they deserve and what they need, and that's what with that experience. Experience. So we're now in this new administration trying to put, you know, to have a bigger uh, picture of that and make it like a, having bigger ambitions. And that's how like we are working on right now. Like we want to, we have this program, as you mentioned, like uh, that is called um, Vital Neighborhoods, uh, where we want to show like in a small uh, scale, what a safe, uh, neighborhood is what a walkable and biking neighborhood is, and then how we connect through, you know, districts and which are bigger than neighborhoods. Like we have, uh, we're, we're thinking about having the city right now. It's divided in 19 different districts. So we're sort of like trying to work on that, seeing how that is working, and trying to come up with a better distribution of districts and make it more, you know, like they, that. To make it more um, sort of like if the, more like connecting them in a better way and sort of like showing what each district has to show and to offer to citizens and we're connecting this like what we're proposing is having those the uh, green corridors which uh, which uh, also promote walking and biking and how those corridors connect to these districts. And as I mentioned before, like in the smaller case, between each district, there are neighborhoods and how we can start like working from each in, in, in some of those neighborhoods to continue the work I, I, I talked to you about, like to continue to work with communities, to showing how the neighborhood could be safe and how they can, you know, like sort of a, require and ask us to to be more you know to have more and more and more safer conditions safe infrastructure and better neighborhoods to live in thank you thank you claudia really interesting and being in the front line you know the and in a public agency you know that this is really interesting to hear you know we consume the the five minutes i'm gonna save the question the follow-up right. question on uh finance the, the, don't worry you know that we, we really love you know to hear from you, you know, the um, uh, public agencies, you know, how you're dealing with this. But let me save that um, follow-up question on, on the financing, because I know that the city is also exploring, you know, beyond the traditional financing instruments, you know, or, 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 or traditional sources. Uh, but let me, let, me, let me save it for the, for the Q&A. Let me move to uh, Mriganka, uh, you know, the, I think, you know, the, 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 
also, you know, from the experience, your experience in, in the India Railway Station Development Corporation, um, I know that, you know, that in terms of implementation, that is always uh, a challenge, you know, that we have seen in these TOD projects. Uh, this model of uh, development corporations have been successful uh, in the U.S. Would you like to share with us, you know, the, uh, how, you know, along this experience, you know, that have been able, you know, to overcome these implementation challenges and how, what reflection on road safety um, um, tips, you know, and recommendation would you have for the other practitioners? Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Felipe. Um, um... The Indian Railway Station Development Corporation projects are still at a very nascent stage um, as of now. So uh, while they are at the design and planning stage trying to get the network in, um, they haven't moved ahead in terms of implementation and being able to, you know, actually bring about a change so far. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, across cities and looking at TODs across cities, uh, unfortunately, there is an entire ecosystem of challenges, if I can call it that. And uh, which almost requires a parallel uh, creation of a parallel enabling ecosystem that can uh, deliver and also institutionalize real, you know, real wide scale transformation on ground. And I think for this, uh, there are three critical things, three buckets of critical things. If I were to look at it in a scalar um, sort of approach and looking at it proce process wise as well, um, specifically for TODs, I think. Uh, the, the biggest thing that we require is before we get into the safety aspects is to get network augmentation within our cities. And I think that's the starting point of ensuring safety. Uh, there is a massive gap in statutory provision across Indian cities, or even if a TOD policy stresses the need for a, you know, a much finer grain, a finer TOD network, other policy frameworks operating within that same city, for example, you know, the master plan or a city mobility plan or a transport policy does not mention any of that. So what then happens is you have conflicting or even uncoordinated policy frameworks and nobody really, you know, a coordinated effort of pushing an agenda no longer exists in a city. And that is something that really needs to be done. Uh, at the same scale, you know, looking at the network aspect, the next big hurdle is uh, the lack of good data and tools, such as you know, urban travel demand models with accurate modal share data. In the absence of this, the likes of you and I can't really push for network augmentation for the secondary and tertiary street networks. Everybody wants you know, 110 meter road, but how do you make them build three 24 meter roads instead? Right? We need these tools to be able to substantiate our recommendations. That's the second gap that I find in Indian cities and must be institutionalized again. And thirdly is uh, the enabling framework or the institutional mechanism to actually create network augmentation plans. So while a policy framework might say that, who actually makes these plans? You know, that is really the coordination between the city authorities and the local elected representatives working at the ward level in the case of India. So um, again, that comes in as a major aspect. Um, budget allocation for network augmentation is absolutely key again. Uh, having worked across cities, it is really difficult to divert funds from a large scale, you know, infrastructure project as a great separator to a network of 18 meter roads or to a network of, you know, cycle networks, uh, cycle um, um, uh, NMT networks, etc. across the street. Uh, the second bucket, I mean, this was the network augmentation bucket. The second bucket that I feel um, as Indian cities we need to push for is Assuming that the network is coming and we have the statutory and regulatory backing to get that to happen is to ensure that whatever piece of infrastructure we build is built the right way, right? So, um, of course, now we have the IRC codes, we have innumerable design guidelines. It makes it easier, but the delivery mechanisms still have gaps in them. So, for example, um, what do I mean by that? So, even a simple scope of work or terms of reference for creating uh, a good piece of infrastructure is missing. You know, you would have a, a, a scope of work which talks about, uh, uh, does not talk about mobility improvement, but talks about building a flyover, right? So these are basics, but needs to be, need to be uh, sorted within these agencies, which are actually responsible for de developing or delivering street infrastructure. Linked to the procurement process again, is um, understanding uh, not only procurement of resources, human resources, 
but procurement of material. Um, so a, a, a key example, if I can give for that, although as you know, street design guidelines might recommend a six inch curb, most um, 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 sort of documents in terms of schedule of uh, schedule of materials do not even include a six six inch curb within their framework. So it's impossible for a government agency to pro to procure materials such as this. So while we are looking at largest you know statutory uh, changes, looking at design guidelines, one needs to really dig deep down to the last you know to the last bolt and actually say, even if we give them a beautiful design how are they actually going to build it uh, as a norm you know i'm i uh, if we have to bring about change across cities we need to ensure institutional change at these specific you know aspects of procurement etc and capacity building at a different scale you know of course we all understand um, the staff and you know the the decision makers and the staff need to be um, need to be sort of worked with, you know, to be able to um, talk about and um, get ownership of the principles. It is the guy who actually builds the road that needs technical training. So the junior engineer responsible for, you know, developing a certain 300 meter stretch does not know um, technical details or would not know that, you know, that uh, a tactile paving is just not creative pattern making, right? So those kinds of things need to be taken down to that level. And lastly, of course, parking management is critically linked to this. And uh, uh, both Abhishek and Prerna talked about that. And all the all the aspects that WRI has been talking about completely resonate with that. And creation of parking management districts is key, again, to reclaim space, to be able to create safer environments. Thank the you. The third bucket. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Felipe. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. We, we, we are already six minutes. Okay, sure. And, uh, sure. I will uh, stop there. Thank I will you. stop there, Philippe. And, and I have to apologize that I didn't introduce you uh, properly. Um, Riganka is the founding partner of Habitat Tectonics, Architecture and Urbanism and City Analytics based in India. I, I had a follow-up question, but let me, you know, that's uh, sure. you know, for sake of time, you know, I will move for our next panelist Absolutely. and probably frame, you know, that question. Uh, Magda Pais, Executive Director of WRI India Ross Center. He has over two decades design and implementing urban programs um, and projects. And I know with a lot of experience, of course, in India and, you know, taking, you know, the, the some of the, you know, very, very good comments of our previous panelists that most of this um, action, you know, lies on the, you know, on the, the mandate, on the urban space that are, you know, that are, that the mandates are in local municipalities, but they lack capacity, they lack the funding. Uh, in your experience, uh, would you able to share some light or on this thought of or your experiences working with multiple municipal uh, agencies and in India and how this, you know, road safety funding initiative of facilities maybe, you know, the, help them, you know, to finance, you know, and to support this transformation of their urban space. Over to you, Magda. Thanks, thanks, Philip. Felipe. Uh, you know, I mean, and again, I'm just building off what Claudia and Braganka have said. I mean, four really four points from my side. Uh, you know, one, you know, I mean, and Claudia mentioned it. You know, uh, the imagination of these spaces is still for cars and for pedestrians to climb bridges and cross. And it's not just people who drive cars, but it's also people who are not in cars. So I think some amount of work, I think, in changing this imagination that you know pedestrians have an equal right on streets and public spaces and that is sort of one uh, larger sort of campaign as such that i think we need to drive and i think so changing the imagination imagination second is you know to a large extent and it's very relevant in india i mean most of the people who are trained uh, to build who build roads right are highway are trained based on highway engineering science and things like that so they are trained to build roads with long side distances and wide roads and things like that. So I think, how do you actually build streets, which, you know, have a lot of people. And I think, so that is, so I think really this, how do you change the mindset of these engineers who actually come from a training of, uh, of building roads, I think uh, becomes extremely important. And, you know, I mean, and really then it comes down to this whole interdisciplinary uh, sort of nature, which is, you know, building roads in, in cities actually requires the three things, right? It's the civil engineering, it is the 
uh, traffic engineering, which is actually the numbers of people and the movement and things like that, and then the urban design aspects. And I think really, I think, um, you know, you need these three sort of uh, expertise to work together. And, you know, that brings me to this third point. And this is where I think, uh, you know, organizations like ours try to really facilitate some of these or at least show as an example, this sort of interdisciplinary uh, coordinated action uh in cities and you know using things like tactical urbanism methods and these temporary installations actually become very useful tools to sort of drive and uh, you know uh, push for these sort of interdisciplinary uh sort of approaches i mean the larger problem of course in india is land uh you know we you know land is mostly privately owned is mostly small parcels uh so amalgamating land aggregating land uh you know, is the largest challenge because once you do that, then you can do your planning. You know, what Mrigankar talked about is actually putting the road network, putting the primary network, secondary network, the tertiary networks. So, so I think, you know, the sort of larger scale problem is to push for amalgamating land, aggregating land so we can plan better. But in the absence of having that, having that kind of land, actually these more acupuncture or sort of you know, tactical approaches then serve serve as tools. And I think as practitioners or as people who are helping like people who actually implement some of these things, I think making some practical choices, finding champions, you know, because you're talking about systems change. And so, you know, really making practical choices, finding champions who would be willing to experiment or support sort of new ideas. And then, you know, really documenting well the learnings from these ideas like we're doing today to bring to scale. I mean, Mumbai, for example, spends uh, half a billion, right? 500 million dollars every year uh, just on maintaining and rebuilding roads in this city. If we are able to, you know, like uh, Vaibhav showed, I mean, with five or 10 percent extra uh, knowledge input, if we can make those investments, uh, end up being much more along the lines of sort of the ideas that we presented, you know, the success will be tremendous. So how do we actually, you know, change municipal practices or transform the markets where the contractors and the people who actually do this maintenance and repair work in cities to actually do things and with these principles, I think. So I think, I think these are the sort of broad points is broadly changing imagination is one big aspect. For me, uh, in India, I mean, ideally, we need to push for wherever TOD projects, if there is a way to amalgamate land, then it allows us to plan not only roads, but other services, parks, public spaces as well. But in the absence of that, how do we use some of these newer techniques? Because in the end, you know, we want to push for this idea of coordinated approach, this interdisciplinary sort of thinking, in, which is absolutely required in cities. So. I'll, I'll stop there and happy to sort of answer questions on any other things. Madhav, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, we can move the, you know, some of the follow-up questions, you know, to the last Q&A segment. Uh, so I will, I will move uh, ahead, you know, with our, our panelists uh, that are part of the financial institution and, and donor agency uh, uh, institution. I will start with uh, Gabriel uh, Arrizueño. He's an or senior urban uh, Specialist uh, at the World Bank based in Lima, Peru. Gabriel, we know, you know, and, and, and I was actually part with you in this uh, several of the studies that we prepared for the Lima Metro and um, uh, on, on TOD um, uh, uh, projects. And, you know, I know that you have a, a, a good summary of the, those barriers, but reflecting on this discussion and the presentation, and the guideline with that we saw, what will be your main takeaways and, and, and key recommendation for practitioners uh, on, on, on moving uh, ahead, you know, with this uh, multi-level agency, multi-level, you know, government, you know, when you face TOD implementation challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe, and thank you uh, everyone for the very interesting uh, presentations and also to the organizers for the opportunity to to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, Felipe, uh, we conducted um, basically two, two studies in India. 
The first was a uh, design uh, of an institutional arrangement to enable a TOD strategy uh, linked to land value capture instruments in metropolitan Lima. And the second study focused on the design of a general framework to implement TOD project specific, specifically uh, linked to the line two of the Lima Metro. I, probably should uh, uh, begin by telling you that Lima is a mega city of uh, around 10 million people. Um, maybe uh, for our Indian colleagues that doesn't, <laughs> it, it is not that big, but in Latin American terms, that is uh, very big. Um, it's, um, it basically hosts around one third of the population of Peru um, and the metropolitan area is divided in 43 districts, which uh, each of them uh, has a different uh, elected uh, mayor. In, in recent years, uh, Peru has invested heavily in urban mobility in Lima. Um, Lima has a, a BRT um, um, line and also a one metro line that are fully operational. And uh, line two of the metro is under construction. A uh, total of six lines are projected in the near uh, future. Um, these transport projects uh, provide an opportunity, of course, to leverage uh, TOD given the large investments uh, uh, made and to, in these TOD projects um, can, uh, of course, uh, generate a more vibrant, uh, livable uh, neighborhoods with better access to infrastructure, housing, services, and uh, of course, a more sustainable uh, urban mobility uh, for the cities. However, uh, these studies uh, uncovered a series of uh, challenges and, and problems. Um, the first is probably uh, that the execution contracts for these um, uh, transport uh, projects did not include uh, TOD uh, considerations. Also, there are no TOD guidelines in uh, the national uh, uh, legal framework to, to promote uh, TOD initiatives. Um, there are also several uh, coordination challenges that are um, related to the uh, complex um, administration uh, framework uh, of Peru. Uh, on the first hand, you have uh, horizontal coordination problems. You, on the one hand, you have the, the transport sector. And on the other hand, you have the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. Um, both of them have different uh, legal frameworks and there is no um, institutional arrangement that allow for a, a common ground. Um, then you have a horizontal um, coordination issues also um, among the different uh, local uh, the districts that comprise uh, metropolitan Lima. Also, you have vertical coordination. On the one hand, you have the central government, which basically finances the, the building of the metro line. Then you have the metropolitan municipality that is uh, responsible for the main roads, including those where stations are located. And then you have the district metro uh, municipalities that are responsible for uh, the adjacent uh, streets, some of them uh, which are not well maintained. Some of them are even not uh, uh, paved, including uh, those that are um, uh, close to the, to the metro stations. Um, you, um, those, that, that, uh, the institutional arrangement to deal with these issues is very uh, complex. You, know, you need uh, a multi-sectorial commission, a technical instance, and, and a range of other uh, institutional arrangements. Uh, since the contracts uh, did not include TOD considerations, interventions will have to take place outside the, the metro stations, focusing on uh, generating a new urban uh, central Realities. Um, of course, uh, at the end of the day, TOD arrangements uh, seek to generate uh, these centralities, improve densities, and promote uh, sustainable and uh, urban mobility and uh, a more healthy and environmentally uh, friendly means of transportation. Now, you know, in uh, uh, Peru is one of the countries that has more uh, uh, fatalities per. Um, 
uh, caused by COVID-19. And this has stressed the need to rethink how urban development is uh, taking place. Uh, historically, cities have been grown um, uh, through the proliferation of uh, informal settlements that gradually become part of the, uh, the consolidated uh, urban area often uh, chaotically and uh, without uh, considerations for uh, urban space or transitability. Uh, um, other Thank problems that... Thank oh, you. Sorry. Um, Gabriel, I think uh, we can we can move uh, to the next panelist and, and probably save you your, your last um, statement to the to the to the follow up question that I planning you know to package at the uh, at the end. So let sure. me let me move to to the to the last panelist, uh, Radoslav um, Katsky. He's a, a program manager of the Royal Road Safety Facility at the World Bank. He's also senior infrastructure specialist. Uh, Rado, I know that you have been uh, working uh, with this facility and supporting and financing several of these uh, uh, projects uh, as a you know donor representative of this um, of this uh, facility. And uh, what have you seen, you know, uh, uh, over the course of the years of the main challenges that, that you know, that the clients, you know, or, or, or project teams face while working with this issue, you know, multinational governments, you know, and the, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, the need, you know, to support these local governments uh, and the implementation and the finance. Over to you, thank you. Hello everyone. Thanks for, for inviting me to this panel. Indeed, I, I wanted to, to share some observations from my experience in uh, uh, Europe and Central Asia context. And obviously the closest to my heart and my, is my, my home country, which is Poland. We've been helping smaller and larger cities, uh, but uh, in comparison to Asian or even uh, Latin American mega cities, these are small ones because our capital is like 1.5 million inhabitants. Uh, and uh, there are lots of cities in my country that are around 100, 150,000 inhabitants. But there are some success stories that managed to address most of challenges. Uh, among those smaller ones and those, uh, those 1 million plus ones. The key challenges they have faced were one, commitment of political decision makers to continue road safety improvements programs or elements of their overall investment programs over years. B, this was uh, external uh, and on this, a lot of communication was needed, a lot of fact-based uh, uh, you know, justifications were needed, involvement of specialized engineers and, and professionals in developing studies and talking to them using the language of benefits. For politicians, it amazes me how they cannot see how easily they can use lives saved on the roads as a political campaigning argument. They can win votes, votes if they can demonstrate that they have contributed to saving lives. And this normally works. So a stable support is, is crucial. Second big point is funding. Uh, obviously, no city, no metropolitan area has enough funding for all investments. So there are two hints that I would share. One, try to mobilize external support, external funding, because this external support is normally uh, stabilizing, at least in medium term funding for road safety improvements. And usually involves also own contribution, which, which additionally preserves some stable flow of funding to these kinds of ideas. The third one is communication with road users. Uh, it has to be done uh, continuously, intelligently, and again, using the language of benefits to the users. Uh, in many contexts, it is about creating uh, livable space in the city and attracting, uh, attracting um, citizens to stay in the city because many cities in this part of the world are depopulating and people, particularly medium-sized ones, people are moving to the super large ones. 
Uh, so to keep people there, you need to attract investments and people and, and cities should be livable. So you have to explain to uh, citizens what benefits uh, they, they can um, expect from these kinds of investments. And they are obvious. Comfort of living, cozier atmosphere. Actually, the, the very successful city that managed to um, implement Vision Zero because it, uh, it hasn't had uh, fatal uh, crashes over the last two and a half years. Uh, 100, 100 and uh, about 100,000 inhabitant city uh, said that uh, they instituted a program co uh, called Cozy Streets. It's basically common sense. You, you put tra traffic into large transit roads and bypasses and, and you leave uh, cities, narrow cities in the town, in the central part of the town. You make them friendly, not just to car drivers, but primarily to all other users, pedestrians, cyclists, uh, and uh, uh, elderly people, kids, and so on, and, and slow down traffic significantly. So, because if you, got, if you get this kind of support of local citizens, you additionally increase pressure on decision makers to, to allocate funds and to continue uh, improvements uh, of road safety. These are in the nutshell, uh, some uh, observations. Obviously, once you implement, you have to report back, communicate back to both decision makers, city council, to keep decisions uh, positive for road safety improvements, and to your citizens to demonstrate and to, to maintain their support to these kinds of initiatives. It's doable, actually. Both cities have managed to improve safety. They have fatalities over the 10 years period. Uh, fatalities decreased by 100% uh, in the case of Yavozno, this smaller town, and uh, by 60% in the case of Warsaw, the capital of Poland, uh, when the average decrease across the country was just 25%. Back to you, Felipe. Thank you, Rada. Thank you very much and for the good use of time. We have uh, uh, eight minutes uh, left for a uh, QA. and I was checking our or chat room, uh, I saw a lot of activity around road safety audits, and uh, I don't know if um, someone would like to come up, you know, and uh, and summarize this. But uh, I will, I would like, you know, we talk a lot about the uh, implementation challenges, and and some of my follow-up questions to the panelists were related to the to the innovation in the in the finance and the funding of this. Uh, uh, um, uh, interventions. Uh, I know that uh, Bogota is, you know, trying to do some innovative, you know, the uh, uh, financing of this uh, intervention, and and Gabriel has also, you know, working with the Minister of Housing on um, supporting this um, investment that sometimes, you know, are, you know, with the local municipality that don't have that capacity. So, um, Claudia and Gabriel, would you like very quick, you know, like a one minute. Uh, response to this question uh, uh, on financing? Yes, sure, I'll start. So very quick uh, promise. So I have two examples that I can think of right now. And one, uh, and which is part of like the most important one for us is, as I mentioned, the plan urban, the urban development plan. If we set clear criteria and we set the clear path that the city wants to take, that means that we're giving the private sector, um, let's say a security for their own developments. So that's one of our bets, like to have this instrument with a clear path and criteria of what we want for our city to come, which is a safer, livable and sustainable city. So with that criteria, clear for them, they will have, you know, like a security that that's the way we want to. So all our private urban developments will comply with that. Uh, and also, uh, the so, so that will sort of like, you know, like alleviate like the, you know, like for the public sector to make all the investments. So we ask the private to do so. And, you know, and to create public space in order if they want to have a bigger, like, if they want bigger build buildings, they will have to provide more public space with the quality and requirements we're asking for. And the second one related to the districts, like the green districts and the green corridors that I told you about, 
we're working together, uh, we're making two changes. The one is we have the city divided in 20 districts, like the plan is to divide it in like to have 30 in total, so an increase in 10. So we will have smaller districts than as we have today, let's say. And what we're trying to do is work with the local mayors from those districts right now and ask them to and to to be part of those of these projects, like the vital neighborhood projects and the district projects. So they have their, you know, like they have money. So what we're doing now from the the mayor um, office, it's they, they they sort of like gave them more resources. So now what we want to have with them is we, uh, as let's say like the secretary of mobility, that we we come with a Yoruba, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, these short term interventions. So they see what we want, you know, like what what are the changes that we want. So the local mayors are the ones who are investing in the long term intervention. So we sort of like working on that, trying to make them, you know, like understand why we want this, when we, why they have to invest in this kind of projects to make their, um, yeah, they, 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 they neighbors uh, 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 safer and livable neighborhoods as, as, as some of you mentioned before. Thank so you. I, I I can think of those two right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I'm sorry, you know, to you know that managing the time is, is so important. And I would just remind you know that this is the the last, you know, the last webinar of this uh series of webinars, you know, around the, the presentation and the showcase of this great resource, you know, that uh, I, I would really like to give the floor to Gerard. Gerard, are you connected? I mean, this is a this is your time. This has been your effort, your leadership. Uh, I, I would just like, you know, to give the floor for you to find out, you know, words. And, and, and once again, Gerard, congratulations for this great work. These are great resources that are being used widely by our clients. And I'm happy to see you again, you know, like uh, continuing leading this effort. Over to you. Well, I mean, first, thank you, uh, Felipe. Uh, it's, it's certainly be the the, the work of an extended team and uh, you know thanks to the WI team for uh, putting a, a lot of effort uh, over the past uh, year in uh, gathering the uh, you know the knowledge that has emerged from the 30 plus cities where the bank has been engaged on transit oriented development and beyond um, you know ultimately there is no question that today thinking about uh, transit oriented development, quality neighborhood has regained uh, even more significance uh, than before because of COVID. People are rethinking about the quality of the surrounding, uh, in particular when you're not able to move as freely as you were before. And uh, as traffic resumed, then it will make the city is much more competitive. So making it safe is going to be critical. I think we have presented over the past for session, a full-fledged approach from the very early assessment uh, to the planning, the design, the implementation, the financing being touched upon today, uh, which kind of uh, captures all the elements. We are now uh, building on those uh, four uh, events, uh, integrating feedback we have received, and we'll be integrating it into version two of the uh, implementation uh, toolkit on TOD. Uh, which will be released very shortly because it's uh, now almost finalized and it was the basis of uh, these uh, four uh, training sessions. So uh, I want to really uh, thank uh, all of you, uh, both speakers and uh, panelists today uh, for, for very rich uh, insights as to how you have done it in your place, as well as the participants uh, for this session today and over the past uh, three sessions because your questions were very useful also uh, for us to understand what you're focusing on and how we can uh, best approach it. So uh, with that, you know, I will uh, uh, go back to, uh, to Felipe and uh, also would like to mention Alina who has been the co-team leader for this uh, and was chairing the session last week. It's been a great, um, you know, uh, partner to work with, this, uh, with me on, on this. Thank you. Thank you, Gerana. I will just leave the minute left to uh, uh, Alina for final words and, 
and um, and welcome and thank you once again you know to all the speakers and participants alina over to you and uh, please you know close the the seminar the webinar Thank you so much. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Gerald, and thank you to the entire team. I will be brief because we have only one minute left, but I think this was a very, uh, it was an amazing project. What we've done in the last year was really great and just, you know, I, a special thanks especially to, to Gerald because he was the one leading this entire project and having a road safety informed TOD uh, toolkit and good practice note, I think this is, uh, this is really great. And uh, also this series of webinars that will be available for everyone to, to uh, watch and to follow uh, uh, starting next week, we'll, we'll send uh, to all the participants registrations. So thank you so much for your participation for and your support. Thank you, Alina, and thank you everyone. We're finishing time. Just just in time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Felipe. Um, I would want to thank everyone who took our time today and joined us for this last session. And as Alina mentioned, we will be uploading um, all the past recordings as well as the presentations from the these four sessions and would we'll share the links with all the participants who registered with us. Um, we thank uh, all the five panelists, Claudia, Gabriel, Madhav, Mriganka, and Rado, joined from different parts of the world and our speakers, my colleagues, uh, Prerna, Vaibhav, and Saurabh. Uh, we at WRI would want to thank all the past speakers and moderators and extend uh, thanks for to Gerard, Alina and Blanca for their support from World Bank and Himanshi, Rama and Bodhi from WRI India. I hope you all have a pleasant rest of the day and stay healthy, stay, stay safe, wear a mask, wash your hands. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.